I'll check the box. Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of the UK Connections. It's Saturday. For some folks, it's early in the morning. For other folks, it's uh, time to hit the pub and uh, have some laughs, talk about music. That's what we do here on this show. In the co-captain's chairs, as always, we got uh, Mr. Simon Bray and Mr. Stephen Reed. And before we get started, what are you fellas drinking today? What have you got, Simon? Uh, I'm, I'm drinking some... Uh... Future Proof, um, Original Mild, which has come all the way from Bristol. And um, mm. I'm drinking mild, and you know, mainly because I am a massive northerner, and that's, you know, kind of like kind of shit that we drink up here. You know, it's um, this is a joke, right? This is a joke. Right? Mild is a sessional drink, which used to be the most popular drink in and around the Northwest recently. Um, it's that sessional. I could drink 56 of these and drive to work in the morning. Wow. That's the job. It, I couldn't really, because that would be really, really bad. But it's like pretty uh, smooth and nutty and barley, barley ate and biscuity and nom, I think is a word that we're looking for. Ah, so the chaps from Lancashire, they like their sweet and nutty type of beers, right? Oh, they used, they used to. And now they just drink piss like Foster's and shit like that. <laughs> You know, one thing I've noticed over the last couple of weeks, Simon always drinks it from the bottle of the can, whereas Mr. Reed always has something in a glass. I do. I do. I do, I do like something in a glass. Even we'll look at and this that color is much glass. different than last week's beverage. So what do you got there? Yeah, well, this week I have gone to the east coast of Scotland and I have something from the Tower Brewery. OK, I've got an IPA from the Tower Brewery, which is excellent. Uh, this is from a little place called Carmiley on the east coast of Scotland, which is somewhere between, for those that know the east coast of Scotland, Arbroath and Forfar. Uh, and it's very nice indeed. This is very hoppy. Uh, really, it tastes how it looks, which is a good thing. I love that glass. Look at that. Stormtrooper. There you go. Ooh. Yeah, this came with a novelty Stormtrooper beer, which was not too bad, actually, but it wasn't as good as what's in this class here. But the glass is cool. So hence Now, of course, you know that if Chris Allo sees this show, he's one of the biggest Star Wars fans I've ever met. He is going to want to know where he can get a, uh, a glass like that. Oh, I could have bought one at Christmas time because I saw them again this year and didn't buy one because I was gifted one last year. Isn't there some more weird like B&M bargains? That that's it. I've seen that. I've got that glass somewhere. Yeah, and I think it was. I think it was an exclusive place like Morrison's that I saw at this Ooh. Christmas. Yeah, about, yeah. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if Chris has got all these original Star Wars figures, but mine are just in a box over there. There we go. He's got a ton of Star Wars figures. I, he may not know where they are, but he's got them. I'm, well, I'm going to mention not. him. I'm going to mention him about that glass because I'm sure he will want one of those. Well, here you go. Look at that. Oh, very nice. <laughs> it's, an, it's an enterprise beer up now. Just, that's that's, where, Ooh, that's yeah. where I stand on the whole Star Wars debate. Wow. So, you yeah, know, forget regularly scheduled program. We're just going to talk about Star Wars <laughs> for the next hour here today. Well, so. I, I thought that I thought that Simon was just describing himself earlier on when he just spoke about his, his tipple for the evening. Sweet and nutty. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no? no? Oh, okay, I'll be quiet. All right. And just so everybody knows, once again, I have the last vestiges of a nice tall glass of uh, um, uh, Republic of Tea, green mint tea. It's almost done. I, I did not refresh my beverage before we started. Boo on me. But anyway, the topic of today in this episode, uh, for all you folks who are enjoying us on Saturday, is uh, meatloaf or fried chicken. So just in case you're wondering when we decided to change this to the Food Network, we have not. So uh, this is going to be kind of like a point counterpoint type of episode. Uh, and this all came about in a little side conversation, we, which we had on last week's program between the three of us, where we were talking about uh, Mr. Meatloaf, who came up in conversation, one of the gigs that Simon saw. And of course, uh, Stephen had mentioned that he never really listened much to Meatloaf, uh, never really much of a fan, doesn't think too highly. And of course, Simon loves the loaf. So we figured we'd do a little episode about uh, the pros and cons of Meatloaf as a viable musical entity. Stephen has done some homework over the last week and went and listened to a whole bunch of the catalog, has you know taken some notes, got some opinions, and Simon is going to talk about why Meatloaf is so great. So uh, we're going to let Mr. Simon go first to talk a little bit about the virtues of 
meatloaf and uh, why everybody needs to be a fan of meatloaf. And then we'll hear from Stephen why he thinks maybe that might not be the case. So Simon, I'll have you kick off this episode. Okay, actually, I'm going to assume that everybody watching this knows who the loaf is because, you know, he's just been a legend for nearly 40 years. Wow, that's a long time, isn't it? I think it's more than 40 years, actually. It's probably close well, to 45. Well, yeah, it depends where you take his legend as starting from, isn't it, really? But, you know, let's not go down that route because we're going to rank the albums at some of the later dates, aren't we? So, <sighs> me and Peter... We're going to rank the albums. I could rank them all now. <laughs> he wasn't oh, invited, man. right? He wasn't invited to that. You've, you've no friends. Okay, so um, Meatloaf is one of the great interpreters of modern popular music. Yes, yes, he is. Put your eyebrows down. Yes, he is. Let's examine that statement, shall we? Could you imagine... Tony Bennett doing Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. I feel like you couldn't. No, you couldn't, could you? Could you imagine Frank Sinatra doing something similar? I feel like, you know, you know, you know these, these people are second rate when compared to the love, I'm just saying. Um, Celine Dion tried, didn't she? Hmm? I mean, that's coming back to me now and I'm just getting the heebie-jeebies, you know. I actually watched this shit today. Um, you know, she really is the... Um, triumph of technique over emotion i'm just i'm saying yeah i'm calling it i'm calling out celine dion that's how up to date my cultural references are and <laughs> barbara streisand did left in the dark um about the jim steinman song and i have watched it they watched the video and if you do if you know if you've not, nothing else to do for six and a half minutes go back watch that video i've watched it three times today and cannot remember the song, even though I remember the song when Jim Steinman did it initially. Nobody else can nobody else can do it like the loaf. But you know what? He doesn't just do Jim Steinman songs. Oh no. No, he also he also does songs from other greats. John Five. Justin Hawkins, your favorite, Stephen, from the Dorkness. Yes, Absolutely. indeed. And of course, as I think what set us off on this last week. Um him, uh, him from Bonnie M. I wonder why I thought we were also going to... He's going to get a mention soon. Don't worry about it. Don't you panic. But yes, of course. Yes, of course. He uh, he has recorded some of uh, My Mate John, as I like to call him, some of uh, some of his tunes as well. So undeniably, one of the greatest uh, interpreters of popular music. I, I think we can all go home now. Now I've won. Well, it's, it's interesting that you say that nobody else can do Meatloaf or Steinman or that kind of thing. How many albums has The Loaf released? Do we know? As Meatloaf? I feel like it's 12. It's yeah. 12. It is 12. I, I went and checked. <clears throat> okay, I mean, putting aside the fact that he has more greatest hits albums than albums, okay, 18, I think, at the last count, greatest hits album, which are filled with the same songs but from 12 albums and i'll be i'll be gracious here and one single how many duets does he have do you know lots lots that that is the technical term now i might be out because i haven't listened to them all okay i make it roughly 32 32 duets okay i mean Basically, he, do he doesn't write the songs and he can't be asked singing half the songs. He gets other people to come in and sing them for him. It's bizarre. I mean, and when we start getting into latter-day duets, I mean, there are classics out there. I mean, <laughs> the good God is a woman, she don't like ugly. Right? That's, that's a duet with who? Chuck D. Oh, I thought now, we just brought some, has some time on the video ones. Oh. Okay, if anyone has something to kill, that's what to not go and listen to because it's utterly atrocious. I mean, who wants to hear Meatloaf interpreted in a rap manner? Well, I don't know, but it would appear that he does because there's another one on the same album. This is from 
Or is it hell in a handbasket? I don't know. He just makes... These words are all... They're all just made up. There's none of these albums are real. Do you know that it's bizarre? So he, got, he gets... Is it Lil John? Sorry, people who care, because I don't really... What's that called? Stand in the Storm. And he's also got Mark McGrath and John Rich on there. There are three people doing the heavy lifting of Wilson Meat at this stage of his career croaks painfully in the background because somebody's holding him away from the microphone at this stage because it's just awful. It's atrociously bad. So who can do Meatloaf? Well, Meatloaf can do Meatloaf and whoever else happens to be walking past the studio, whether that be Cher or whether that be Patty Russo, who is fantastic, I may add, or Roger Daltrey. I mean, he duets with Roger Daltrey. How can you make Roger Daltrey sound bad? Well, you can ask him to sing a song called Bad Attitude, where the two of them start to go, you got a bad attitude. No, no, you got a bad attitude. No, 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 you got a bad attitude. Oh, no, 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 you got a bad attitude. It's the campest thing you'll ever hear. I mean, for anyone that's as old as us in the UK, I expected them to go, oh, but you are awful. It's, oh, so bad. It's absolutely so bad. So, so who else can do meatloaf? Everybody, anybody, whoever's free, who, who wants the session? That's who else can do meatloaf. No? Wow, not, not a nice thing to say at all. Woo! <laughs> terrible person. You know, I, I realise that people have been asking for more negative, negativity from Sea of Tranquility, but Stephen, I really think you need to have a good, long, hard look at yourself. <laughs> I'm well, really good. I'd, I'd rather not do that, to be fair. <laughs> Nobody wants oh, to do no. that. Yeah, well, just just disappointing. Do you know, I have to say that, you know, you're clearly talking about the bad attitude. Sorry, bad attitude. That's uh, uh, yes, attitude. 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 <laughs> Generally, for many, many years, I knew it was a duet. And I'd, I'd read about, me. I'm, I'm sure that Meatloaf said in Kerrang at one point, um, that you know they were they, they were virtually shitting themselves in the studio just to get that you know that and I couldn't tell for many many years which one was which, and I appreciate they don't necessarily sound that similar, but I, you know, it did take me a long while to work out which was rog, and which was the love. Mm. Well, I, I listened to earlier today and. I actually had to go and look through the credits. This was what started me down the rabbit hole of how many duets there are, because I actually thought he was singing it to himself. And I thought, now this is weird, because he's singing, you got a bad attitude. No, you got a bad attitude. No, you got a bad attitude. No, you got a bad attitude. And I thought, I mean, I know he's had problems, but he's lost the plot now. He is actually in the studio singing to himself. And only when I looked at the credits did I think, oh, wow, there's a world-renowned singer on here and it's not Meatloaf, <laughs> okay? And I know he is. I know, I mean, I'm being harsh, okay? I'm not a Meatloaf fan. I will concede that the debut had a couple of good songs on it. There you go. That's, that's, that's almost some love for it. But it's cabaret schmaltz is what it is. Without Steinman and without Rundgren, we wouldn't even be having this conversation and it must really pain Steinman that realistically he can't he couldn't go and do this under his own steam. When he tried, no one listened. And then to make matters worse, Meatloaf has filled the subsequent albums with songs that were left behind by Steinman. He's just all of these things that were meant to be let go or used as bonus tracks 40 years down the line because people will buy things 45 times over. <laughs> right? They were never meant to be in albums, but they've made whole albums out of these songs now. Right. I mean, it's an interesting discography. It's an interesting conversation because obviously the winning formula is Meatloaf and Jim Steinman, right? And obviously, you know, the best selling and arguably, you know, arguably the best album that was ever done between these two guys is the first one, Bad Out of Hell. And really, Meatloaf only approaches those type of sales figures when they do another Bad Out of Hell album. And, you, and Steinman's got to be involved, right? That's, it's a winning formula. But I will say to Meat's defense, uh, regardless, you know, he may not be a songwriter. Uh, he may have made all sorts of bad decisions in his career. The guy in his prime had a great voice. I'm not talking about now because I've seen him live like maybe 10 years ago and that was pretty rough. But uh, guy's got a great voice. I mean, you ever have you heard him on that Ted Nugent album? He's terrific. 
And you almost wonder, I mean, here's a guy that even if he never did Bad Out of Hell, after that free-for-all album that he did with Ted Nugent, he appears on almost half the album. I mean, he could have easily been a lead singer for any band, any heavy rock band, and made a career for himself, I think, personally. That, that album, I, I am, uh, you know, I, I really wish I was Stephen Reed in many ways and could actually like get my shit together and bring stuff down. You know, that album is on my turn, turn, turntable right now. Every t- virtually every time I've been into the Man Cave this week, I've listened to, to that album. Fucking great record that is. It is. Yeah. Really, e- even the bit where the, the bits where the nude sings. That is a fantastic 1970s hard rocking album from start to end. It really, it really is. And the love's absolutely awesome on it. You know, it does, you know, it doesn't just just have to do the uh, big operatic over the top shit. It can do, it can do other stuff. You know, and people with ears, you know, like not you, Stephen, will appreciate this. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, later, Stephen, I'm going to put your email address in the comments section and just see <laughs> how much you enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that the guy can't or the guy couldn't sing, OK? I, I, as, P, as Peter says, recent times, I, and he's not alone in that, it has to be said, he has struggled to replicate the glory days behind the microphone. I think that the problem, being a little bit more serious, is that because he is, in effect, a one-man band, and I know he's got a regular kind of cast round about him for an awful long period, but with all due respect to an awful lot of talented people, nobody really cares about that. It wouldn't. Whoever the band was going to be, people buy tickets on the strength of the fact that they see meat and loaf on the ticket. That's, that's what it's all about. But realistically, I mean, and you can go and have a look on YouTube, some of the more recent, by more recent, I mean a couple of decades, live performances are, I would say laughable, but that's unfair, embarrassing, because you can almost, he knows himself, but the fact that he's then putting himself out there and playing ginormous arenas, knowing that this this is not a thing that's going to happen, that's questionable for want of a better turn of phrase. But I think that, that what you're saying, Peter, about the, the album with the Nuge, that's valid. Meatloaf was a fantastic singer and, and tremendous charisma as well. Do you know, to carry off some of the stage stick that he did, do you know, w- was really quite phenomenal. You couldn't take your eyes off him in, in the early days when he was singing and when he was performing, whether by himself or with someone alongside. But realistically, to me, what it proved is that those albums where he had to go and try and do something slightly different and when the times changed, he really wasn't capable of adapting. I mean, we touched on the album Blind Before I Stop. Is that, is that what it was called? But, I mean, that album title in itself is, is, is remarkably questionable. I mean, Blind what Before I Stop. Oh, knocking that album out. Do you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> Right. Uh, what, what, what came after? I mean, actually, on Simon's recommendation, I listened to that album for the first time in my life last week. And as 80s albums that are subpar magnum go, it's not bad. But that's what it is. It's not bad. It's him desperately trying to squeeze himself into a different form because without people setting it all up for him, it just couldn't happen. And what goes on from there tumbles almost into parody, right? One of the things I really dislike, well, I really dislike, I do anything for love, but I won't do that. I, I really genuinely dislike that song. I really dislike that song. You don't like how it starts. It, it, that's, I had this thought before you carry on. Um, that song, much of that kind of album is in fact... And I know you don't like them. Ten. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We've got a seven-hour intro. Oh, yeah. We've got <laughs> okay. a huge hook. You think the song's finished, and then it goes on for another couple of hours at the end. And then <laughs> it, it kind of does it again. And then and you, you're just like, you just, where's, where's that last fucking symbol coming? What's that? Go, 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 go. Ding. And, it, and you think, that could have been a really great, like, five-minute song, four-minute song, you know. But no, it just goes on forever. How long was the single version? Do we know? It was I mean, long was it too. Long? I think the single version is seven or eight minutes, right? Yeah. I, I mean, 
the album track is over 12 minutes long. Yeah, it's great. But the thing is, from there, he kind of tumbles into parody. The thing with Meatloaf is once he gets a, a bit of success, and don't get me wrong, that's more than a bit of success. It was number one everywhere. I, I want somebody, maybe not in this virtual room, but maybe somebody down in the comments to explain how it could be a number one in the US Billboard charts, but only number 10 in the USA rock charts. How does that work? Anyway, moving along. Okay. <laughs> I don't it was number one everywhere. But when he bat out of hell was ginormous. So he has bat out of hell two. He has bat out of hell three. He has something else with hell in the title because, well, there you go. All the album art, which is quite cool to be fair, most of it, other than the ones that's got him going on the front, <laughs> all look pretty much the same. I don't mind that, actually. He mucks about with a logo. The logo is great at the start. Why are you mucking about with the logo? Don't let anyone in the 80s tell you it should be all lowercase. Slap them, right? The logo is fantastic. But he basically tries to remake the debut, with a couple of exceptions in the 80s, every single album. But he got into this horrible thing of I do anything for love, but I won't do that. I'll kill you if you don't come back. Okay, he got into this kind of almost cabriact pun thing that he would do. Good girls go to heaven, but bad girls go everywhere. Do you know? I'd lie to you, and that's the truth. It's just, it's like he's got an idea, and, and he, he, he got a ginormous hit with it, and we keep going. So then there's things like, I'd fight hell to hold you, but only if someone turns the heating down. Okay, or there's my heart would crack if I couldn't love you, but I know your hands are made of super glue. Now, okay, I'm starting to make some of these up, but that's not the point. You'd, if you hadn't heard Meatloaf albums, you wouldn't know, because that's how ridiculous these are. In the land of the pig, the butcher is king. I've stopped making them up now. These are real. <laughs> that's actually you know a pretty good heavy song, though. That, that's a yeah, it really good. is. Yeah. yeah you know, do you know why this is? If, if I could just interject for a goddamn second. <laughs> I've got a list myself of uh, things. You know what? Um, I, I think this is. This can be explained. You know, like, well, like we explained the Quo um, uh, record company pressure. I'm yep. very, very confident that's uh, played a part uh, with the law. You know, I mean, oh look, look how many bazillion copies Batters of Hell sold. Mm, get back in that studio now and make another one. Well, he couldn't do it because his voice had gone. Um, but do, do you know what? Uh, somebody in the comments a while ago uh, said, please be more parochial. Uh, so, yeah, um, Meatloaf is the Ian Dowie of rock. Yes, yes, he is. Because he's got bounce back ability. <laughs> you know, bats out of hell, lo lost his voice. Yeah, Jim, Jim bogs off, makes bad for good without him. You know, um, he, he loses all his money. Does does that stop? Does that stop meat? Does it? No, no, it doesn't. No, it, no, it doesn't. I, it what I'd like to know is how does someone lose all their money when your debut album sells fourteen million copies? Oh, just Google is your friend. Actually, no, point. not fourteen million copies. Fourteen times platinum is that twenty five? Mm. I don't know. Whatever the hell it is, it's ridiculous. I think it's two times diamond. Was that twenty five million? Whatever the hell it is, it's it's ridiculous. I think you lost a lot of that money in the same fashion as Status Quo did. Yeah, probably. Yeah. If Meatloaf, you're watching and your lawyers want to get in touch with <laughs> Stephen I mean, Bad Investments. Bad Investments was where I was going with that. So I, I, I don't know where you're taking that. Not a clue. Tapping your nose. Like, <laughs> that's, that's the official sign for Bad Investments. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, yeah, I feel like, you know, he's, uh, the fact that he, he's 74 now, I think, isn't he? And he managed to do huge concerts until, until you know, what, seven or eight, nine years ago? It managed kind of what war, war, war go through um yeah I've, i mean he, he was there. Yeah. well not necessarily in spirit <laughs> certainly in body but uh yeah yeah sorry let me let, let me get back to how much i'm sorry love sorry you had a list sorry because i do and you know what if i if, if um there was a world in which the love could still produce it and he was only going to sing the songs from bass out of hell one two and three which he practically does I wouldn't go because I want to see songs from Blind Before I Stop. I want to see uh, songs from Bad Attitude. I want to see the Wilderness Years. I love the Wilderness Years. I will 
uh, bat for the wilderness years for for eternity. I love those records. They mean so much to me. I love them. Love them. Dead, Dead Ringer too. Was a pretty good album. Dead Ringer was ignored, but that was the follow up. But that that's pretty yeah. good. Album. Dead Ringer's got good stuff. Huh? Fucking great record. Yeah. yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. you would go to bat for bad attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah. The thing, well, the thing was that um, you know he spectacularly unsuccessful, but we kept him going, didn't we, in the UK? Mm -hmm. We, it's our well, fault. We <laughs> yeah, we we kept him going. You know, like I said last week, I went to see him in '86 at the at the arena, and it was full. Yeah. And he was as popular as the proverbial fight in a space suit at that point in the rest of the world, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, Peter's it, it, point about the. And your point, Simon, about bounce back ability. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I, I doff the cap to him for that because he's either basically handing albums out for nothing because nobody wants them, or he's number one across the world in all formats and albums and singles and everything. It's, it is, it's the proverbial boom and bust, isn't it? It's really is quite unbelievable. It, mm. it says an awful lot about the buying public, okay, because. I, I'm not a meatloaf expert. However, not all the albums that have the words hell out of and bat on them are his best albums. But they sell by the barrel load because those words happen to be on the front. Yeah. That's that I mean, follow-ups are a dangerous thing. And to be fair, he managed to get his biggest single release hit from a follow-up album. That's incredible. And, and, and you really do have to take your heart to I really genuinely dislike that song. I disliked it then, and I dislike it now. However, success is success, and you can't take that away from them. Much of success doesn't in any way guarantee quality, I may add. But there mm -hmm. are albums in the catalogue, and I will, much though we're having a bit of fun here, I will agree that actually what becomes between the, the debut, which is a decent album, and the follow-up is quite interesting. There is, and there are some really good songs on there, to be fair. But for some reason, he just couldn't get that across. And I don't really understand why, even though it was pocketed with single hits. He just never managed to get any sort of massive success unless he pretended he was remaking the first album again. Mm. Well, I mean, here's one thing to bring up, which I remember even at the time, because I bought Bad Out of Hell when it first came out. So I was 11 years old. It took him four years to follow that up with Dead Ringer. By the time Dead Ringer came out, I think the majority of the buying public had moved on to other things. He yeah, needed to strike when the iron was hot. It's a very similar situation to the Boston scenario, right? Although Boston, I think the second album came out within like two years, but then there was a massive wait after that. But I mean, Bad Out of Hell, we just talked about, was massive. Dead Ringer did go platinum. Midnight the Lost and Found went gold. Bad Attitude went gold. Blind Before I Stop went silver. I'm not even sure what the hell silver is. Bad Out of Hell 2 went five times platinum. Welcome to My Neighborhood, which came out two years after Bad Out of Hell 2 went platinum. This is here in the States. Couldn't have said it better. Barely squeaked out gold. Bad Out of Hell 3, which was released in 2006. So that's already 13 years after part two. That went platinum. Hang Cool Teddy Bear was silver, <laughs> and then he's never certified since then. Well, he's been certified since all sorts. Um, it's an interesting parallel story, Simon. I will let you talk about your list. Even though the lists are my thing, I'll let, I'll let you talk about your list <laughs> just in a second, because I think a really intelligent comment there, okay? Which is not, not what we're doing. Um, the parallel between Meatloaf and Boston is interesting, because Boston had that debut album in the can for a long time. Okay, and then it comes out, blows up. It's fantastic. So arguably, as a lot of first album bands have, the second album's already kind of on the way. Okay, and then he took an eternity to get to third stages. Okay, an absolute eternity to get there. Meat would have released an album the next day if he could have written songs. And that's the problem, is... Jim Steinman was meant to be, I think, was there a four album deal or something along those lines where he would write all of those songs. But because the person that actually made the Innovator Commons, because I don't think it is, but some people do, the masterpiece, 
because his attention was elsewhere. Meatloaf, instead of being a, a perfectionist, was forced by the record label to go and gather together whatever he could and record an album. And that's where it all kind of starts to go, mm, what are we doing here? You're looking confused, and have I got that wrong? On my end, you turned into a Dalek <laughs> part way through that, so I just don't know what you said, but you know, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> That's good. I, I do like it when I can't be challenged. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that the, the second album was kind of cobbled together because Steinman was meant to have been there writing it and wasn't. And the record label basically said to Meatloaf, it, 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 we need an album like t tomorrow. Well, here, all right, so here's what, all right, let's we'll make sure we get the story correct here. So, the second album, which was supposed to be the second album, wound up being a Jim Steinman solo album. That was bad for good. That should have been the de facto yes. second album from Meatloaf. Uh, and actually, for whatever, I don't know why that turned out to be a Jim Steinman solo record. I, I also think the record label, too, recognized... Meatloaf lost song. his voice, didn't it? I, th yeah. I think that has something to do with it. So by the time Dead Ringer came out four years later... Uh, Steinman still wrote all that material, but you're correct, Stephen. That was made up of all these songs that maybe didn't make Bad for Good, didn't make uh, Bad at Hell all these years later. Actually, I think Dead Ringer is a pretty damn good album. But again, it's four years. And in 1981, we well, know the musical climate is changing already, right? So, yeah, it's too long. It's too long. But if he lost his voice, not much you can do, right? I mean, yeah, that's true. That's true. Anyway, Simon, so you had a list and I still let you talk about your list. I'll be I have a list. I think I've done two of them, haven't I? Oh, where to go to next? He said rather comfortably. Let's find out. Shall I? And you know, I know. Mm. Yes. Um, I, I just, do you know what? I want, I want to think, I want to, I'm, I'm specifically talking to people in the UK at this point. When was the first time that you saw me? Well, for my friends, when was it? Mm. Could it possibly have been the old grey whistle test? And how can I say this without being really creepy? Carla DeVito. Yeah. There's, there's, go and watch it. There's a, it's on YouTube. There's a clip. Uh, but somewhere in the, in my mind, um, they do about her spell. She's not wearing that much. But the performance is, by the band, is brilliant. Meatloaf's vocals really, ro really, really ropey and hoarse. Um, but the, the, in my mind, at the end of the clip, uh, David Hatworth comes out of it and, and roughly does this. This is where the glasses are back on. Yes, boys. She wasn't very much, was she? And um, for a you 12-year-old at that point, like, what the... Whoa. Whoa. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So you, you've got, like, woman and just, like, this incredible song, you know, that goes on for days, but has different little sections. You think, what the heck? That's, like, nothing else that's currently around, you know, because... We're all supposed to think that back in 78, 79, you were listening to punk. When actually, everyone's listening to disco and meatloaf. Yeah. You know, um, history is, is, is kind of like a little bit revisionist. And, you know, that's what people were actually listening. Hence the shitloads of sales. Yeah. yeah. I, I must I mean, I, I was obviously far too young at that stage to be watching something oh, yes. as racy as, as that. Simon it was Quigley. very sexual. I mean, that's yeah. I've seen a performance since because uh, these days on BBC Four or whatever it is, they show quite a lot of the classic old grey whistle tests, which is much better than any music that BBC will put on currently, obviously. Um, and I must admit that that performance and Meat's vocals are not great, but it doesn't really matter to be fair, because the whole thing. Is pretty fantastic. It is really pretty fantastic. It, it's, so, uh, as Simon mentioned, the band are tight as hell, but they're firing on all cylinders. It's not just that they're you know competent, which they are. Oh my God, they are. But wow, they mean it. They really mean it. That, that's a band that deserve much more credit for what they were capable of making those songs come over like live because that was just it's powerful as hell. And even now watching it, and I'm not a massive fan. I hope the two people do get, we're having a bit of fun here. I'm not a Meatloaf fan, but we're having a bit of fun here. But on a more vaguely more serious note, on a performance like that, I, I must admit that I wish I'd seen him live around that kind of time because it is compelling stuff. And yes, 
I can understand all <laughs> or nearly all red-blooded young men at that time came going, wow, what the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if the sound's on or not, but I'll watch. Do you know, but it, it is also, with modern glasses on, a little uncomfortable at the same time, because they are really, really, really close. <laughs> For want of a better turn of phrase. But it's also still quite believable. Uh, which mm. maybe what is why it makes it quite uncomfortable. It's almost like you're being a voyeur mm. as you watch that clip. But well, how many people were in that uh, same situation when they were kids, right? In the car with the first girlfriend, maybe, right? I mean, so here you have this this kind of like rock opera music uh, to a very familiar situation that so many mm. young people have found themselves in, right? But, uh, but yeah, yeah, but it, it's it got pretty suggestive there. Right in front of the camera. And, but Meek comes from a theatrical background, doesn't he? Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, what, what, you, what you certainly always got from him was that kind of sense of spectacle and um, performance. He doesn't just sing the songs, he acts the songs, doesn't he? It's almost right. like he's performing as Meek Love. In the city, you know, same way that Alice Cooper is not really Vincent Bernier, you know what I mean? Um, just when he, when he you know, like the, the vocal was incredibly ropey, but he gave everything he had everything which moves me on to my next point you see what i did there going back, going back to the bounce, bounce back ability how many times have you seen the headline meatloaf collapses on stage um just tons and tons of times you know it's just like he, he's fallen off the stage you know to where he's finished finished off a show in uh, in somewhere in a wheelchair you know that's commitment as far as I'm concerned. He fainted twice in 2016, didn't he? You know, and then did gets he? back up and did. Yeah. Did he? Did he? Oh my god, did he not? Well, I think I think they said that he did. Do you know? Oh. I mean, they used to did they not like tour with oxygen off the yeah, side of the that's it, that, that, yeah, oxygen yeah. tanks. I mean, there's nothing about that that strikes me as a bit of a gimmick. Nothing at all. Really? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, you get the you get the full the full the full hundred and ten percent effort from from the love. <laughs> uh, I mean, if anyone could give more than hundred percent, it's the love. There's it's no true. ways about that. Yes, and, and that's the true. true. <laughs> yeah. oh. I mean, oh, nice. oh. and in between all, like he's, he's, even, he's even doing movies and things and TV shows. I, mean, I haven't seen him much of late, but he was for a while there. He was popping up all over the place. Yeah. Could, could, but that would, that's one of my many points about the greatness of the love, his acting career, you know, um, and also his tangential um, thingy. Yes, he's tang tangentially. He's, he's one of the people that um, are attracted to one of my Simon meets a celebrity. Um, yeah, so I guess. Really? You're just doing that, are you? You don't, you don't no, want no, to. No, it's warm in here, and my my hand is, is cold off my beer. I am merely cooling my brow, as, yeah, as no, no, no. with with panties thrown on onto the stage for him by some deluded granny. No doubt. Well, I've got, my, got my big meatloaf scarf on just to. <laughs> I'm not going to hold up like that while I'm singing. Yes, yeah, so there you go. So you know, obviously, it was in um, uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. No. Mm -hmm. Cult, cult classic, sure we can all agree on that one, which reminds me that I once sat uh, behind Richard O'Brien in the theatre, so I now class him as my uh, celebrity mate. Yeah. But, but did you meet him in a cupboard? I did not, but I did sit right behind him, and he was in the VIP section, and the, the VIP section, I shit you not, was behind a curtain. <laughs> Basically, he went and stood in a little corner where, where a bar with the world's oldest barman, and it was behind the curtain. And do you know what? In the full Wizard of Oz thing, I, I peeked behind the curtain. I'm just oh. like, I know, just like Richard and a couple of other people, just like that. <laughs> then he went and sat right in front of me. I just wanted to shine his head. But, you know, know, like, it's, it's amazing, Simon, because th this little rabbit hole of, of loafdom that I've been compelled to dive headlong into. There are, I can't remember how many, I did write it down, but the notes that I've written for this are just ginormous because there's so much that you could marvel or, or, or ridicule. Um, 
and I think there's something like 642 backing singers on Bat Out of Hell, or whichever album it is. I mean, you read the credits, and it's just, they're making names up, there's that many. I mean, because you don't want me to sing all the way through, because you can't. Um, and I'm really surprised that your name's not there, because that, that's now two people from the meet entourage that, yeah. you're on, you, that you are on first name terms with. Absolutely. Mr. He's in the cupboard par. Okay. Mm. So I actually think that you, you must have been in the studio for at least one of these albums. Because, I mean, basically, if you breathed within, like, a 6,000-kilometre radius of Meatloaf at one point, you would have asked to sing on the album. album. Yeah. No? Mm -hmm. No. And I think, I, think, I, I think you were. Definitely think you were. Um, I, I must have been. You know, I think you were Sammy Hagar in disguise. That I didn't realise that Sammy Hagar was on anything to do with Meatloaf. That was, that was news to me when I went and looked that up. Yeah, there you go. Steve, I was on a new love film. Yeah, yeah, but he, he, he did get into that stage where, because we all know in this day and age that if you're an aspiring musician who can't quite make the breakthrough, but you have a couple of pounds in your pocket, or dollars even, what you do is you go through the Rolodex of somebody else and invite every musician in the world to come play an album in the hope that having the same names that everybody else has got on that sticker, on the hype sticker that I'll keep on the front of your album will mean that more than four people might actually buy it. And that's what Meat's last, last two albums are all about. It's all about part three featuring John Five, Steve Vai, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, Chuck D, uh, uh, Sammy Hagar's in the house. Brian May's here. Brian, everyone. Do you know, it's like... <laughs> I mean, it, it is really at that stage in the last couple of albums where he's Kind of going, well, if my name's not going to sell it and he's got the logo back, he's got the logo back, and the artwork are great on it. some of these last albums that are really yeah, not very yeah. good. Yeah, uh, really good artwork on them. And he's at that stage where, and admittedly, he's getting A listers. Okay, he's not getting the usual people that are doing their outs. He is going out and getting A listers. But that says a lot about those last two albums. That to me, it really is. I don't have very many songs here that are very good. So let's see who I can get to try and make them interesting and I think that's the stage you got to with the last couple of albums because I mean well, you two are going to do a ranking show and I don't want to steal your thunder well, what's the top and what's bottom and various things but I mean I listened to what's the one that's got the skulls on the front what's that what's that second what? last one I've got it written down but I, I yeah that is um so what on the front is that braver than we no, are it's the it's the the, the world the earth <sighs> But it's all skulls. Oh, hell in a handbasket. That's it. Hell in a hand. How could I forget the the classically titled Hell in a Handbasket? <laughs> Produced by Lil John. There you go. You see. I mean, the, the wheels are off by this stage, aren't they? Are they not? You know, we we were talking before about the movies he appeared in. I, I yep. urge anybody listening or watching to go onto the, the Meatloaf Wikipedia page and look at all the films and TV shows he has appeared on. Yeah. It's ridiculous i mean mm. it's huge I, I'm, I'm going through this i'm like holy cow i didn't know he was in that film it's like it's amazing it's amazing and he, yeah there's appearances on there i i looked earlier today and there's things that i thought he's not in that and then you go oh he is actually he is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. obviously, I, I, obviously I, we, we can't talk about the best known film that he was in absolutely because the first rule of the best known film that he's in is that you can't talk, talk about, about the best known film <laughs> If we could, we would have done, wouldn't we? I completely forgot he was in the film that we cannot mention because we can't mention He's brilliant it. in that. Yeah, and he is brilliant That's in it. He sad. is absolutely brilliant in it, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And then you, then you see that he, went, he he must have had money trouble later on because he went, went into episodic TV, didn't he? You know, he, he was in an episode of House. He was in an episode of Elementary. He, oh, he turned whoa, up. Whoa, 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 Of course wow. he's in an episode of House. Because Hugh Laurie's doing this on one of his albums. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we've got half of Fry and Laurie, there's a bit of UKism for anybody, okay, doing this on one of the Meat Loaf albums. Please buy it, please, please. Hugh Laurie's here, he's playing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm done with that bit. The only, other, the only other thing I want to say, and you, you alluded to it, um, is the band. Jesus Christ, he's had some good players in the band. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. No, I, I can't, I'm not going to argue on this point. No. some point, he's had both Kulik brothers. Yeah. Bruce, early doors. Um, yeah, David Johnson on um, 
dead ringers. I love David Johnson. You know, why did he stick around with Elton John for all those years? Oh, yeah, I know. Shit loads of cash. Wow. That's right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> regular that, payday. That's you know what I mean? Pat Thrall, yeah. Thrall. Uh, Kasim Thrall. Sultan. That's right. Chuck Berg. Yeah. yeah. Chuck Berge. Yeah. Alan Merrill of I, I Love Rock and Roll fame. Just, just, you know, whatever you think about him, um, his band was always, always shit hot. Yeah. yeah. There are albums there and songs that I'm not keen on, but I must admit that musically, none of it is just dialed in. None of it, or faxed in, even, you know, to go with things. <laughs> um, and yeah, absolutely. I, not just in the early stuff that everybody knows and that we're talking about on the Old Grey Whistle Test where that band is phenomenal. The performances across all of the albums are first rate. The material, in my humble opinion, isn't always up to the standard of the people playing it. And that's the problem. Some of the non-album tracks, some, not all, just most of them, really are pretty poor. <laughs> but, and there's another parallel with a quote, is if nothing else, whoever was picking the singles out knew what they were doing. Because the, the singles are, whether I like them or whether I don't, are universally the best things on the albums. They, they are the things that, and they represent him very well. They're all very meatloaf. Do you know, and that that's there's something to be said for that because there's lots of bands you look at their albums and you go, why didn't they release this? Why didn't they release that? I can't do that with, with Meatloaf. He released the yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good song. point because some of the albums that maybe aren't as successful start to finish, and there's there's a few of those. Uh, the songs that are really good have that formula, and the reason yeah. why people gravitate towards them, and the reason why they released the singles because they sound like what we'd expect meatloaf to sound like because i think when he goes and tries to do different things maybe it doesn't really work as much it's almost like you know that there is there is a certain thing that we want to hear from meatloaf there's a sound there's a formula and that's what's ingrained in everybody's minds and when he sticks to that it's pretty good when he tries to do something completely different mm, maybe not but you know to answer steven's point from previously if you know let's assume that the record buying public are a bit thick. If he doesn't say, this is Bat Out of Hell 64, they're not going to know. They're not going to gravitate towards it. Yeah. yeah. You have to like yeah. grab grab them by the little hand and wave, you know, and, and walk them to it, don't you? Because if you're going to call, call something blind before I stop, they're going to go, what? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I feel like <laughs> hell, <laughs> hell in the handbasket. <laughs> I think yeah, yeah. Hankel what? Yeah, yeah. You know, this is an interesting dilemma, though, when you think about it, because we've had lots of mega, mega selling albums in rock and roll history. I mean, let's you know the first Boston, which was just called Boston, Fleetwood Mac Rumors, uh, you know, the Cars Candy O, and the self titled album Led Zeppelin Four. I mean, we can go on and on and on, but none of those other bands felt the need that they had to put out a sequel with the same title just to get people to buy it. Good songs mean good songs, right? So but why did that never work for Meatloaf? Why did they have to, do, to have it tagged with this whole bad out of hell thing in order for people to say, oh, yeah, I'll buy that. I'll listen to that. Shouldn't it just be, this is Meatloaf. It's a new album. Buy it, right? It's interesting that you say that because as you were going through, and you're absolutely right, Peter, because these bands did not just go rumors to you know, and and although you look at Boston's album art, and they're, they're clearly kind of going, yeah, there's similarities there, yeah, same band there. Yep. But a good example of how you change it while still basically calling it part two is ZZ Top because you have Eliminator and you follow it with Afterburner and then you, you know, bring up the rear with Recycler. And there's a clear pressure to do the same thing again which it was clear with hindsight, they were kind of going, <laughs> but clearly getting Viva Las Vegas into it, you know? And so they, that's that's putting the pressure against the regular, so we're not going to do it, and then we know you will. That obviously was the kind of meat in the middle, which happened to be somewhere over here, because it's really not in the middle at all. But with Meatloaf, it just, there is that kind of, as I say, there's a synergy between the album covers. So even when you look at Bat Out of Hell, and then you look at, I think it's Bad Attitude, Bad Attitude, that's got the scantily clad lady on the motorbike on the front. So one's a great illustration and one is a photo shoot. 
but the, the message is, guys, it's the same thing, really. It's the same thing, really. The, the, the logo's the same. The atmosphere's the same. There's still a bike on them both. And the public went, huh? Pardon? That's not, is that the same? It's not the same. It doesn't say bat out of hell on it, does it? No, it doesn't. And it's only when he puts those words on the front because you look even further down the catalogue, and I really am actually, I was quite taken by some of the album art today, which I'd forgotten further down the line. Yeah. There's yeah. some care put into that. The presentation of most of the albums, yeah, the mm, Blind Before It Stops, a real anomaly in that sense. There's a UK cover and a US cover, and the competition made us which one's worse. Because <laughs> they're yeah. both terrible. Yeah. Really bad shots yeah. of meatloaf. Do you know, really bad shots of meatloaf. Really, a guy with lots of charisma, and he looks terrible on both. I mean, he's a he's a he's a shampoo advert in the American one with all this glowing lock in the background. What were well, they thinking? Do you know, Good job that the music speaks for itself on that one. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I, mean, I, I see your point though about the whole brand thing, right? And that's why, to me, it's in a, it's just crazy that Dead Ringer, which was the follow-up, uh, although even Jim Steinman's album that came in between had yeah, that meat look to it, yeah, right? It looks Dead same. Ringer, I mean, look at the cover. I mean, it's the guy, you know, with the bike that's coming out of the water. He's got the girl with him and it's got the logo. I mean, it looks like the second album, the continuation of that out of hell. But again, four years after. The, the interesting thing. thing for me as well, as a non-loafer, okay, going through the catalog today and, and a couple of a couple of days now that I've been looking through and kind of seeing the journey that he's been on is that most of the albums that even are massively successful have two or three singles that go boom, massive hit. And then the third or fourth one goes, yeah. And it falls off a cliff. Do you know, is it what's the one that's got lemon in the title? Life is like a lemon, I want my money back. Money back. There you go. It's got the Nelson Brothers singing on it. I didn't know that until today either. There you go. It's got, I don't live with that jewel of love and affection. The, I mean, I, I like that song. I like Nelson. <clears throat> anyway, all credibility out the window there, but that's that's fine. Lovely locks as well. Uh, they're singing on that song, but that absolutely bombed that song. So even on an album where things went through the roof, there are songs on it that the public just went, nah, nah, I'm not having that. I'm just not having that at all. It wasn't like Def Leppard who basically just released the entire Hysteria album and everyone went, I'll have more because it makes a jigsaw. Okay. And I, I really think, it's interesting, I think we did a show with Martin many moons ago about, or maybe it was the Hudson Valley Squares, the greatest hits is enough. All you need to know about this band is the greatest hits. The fact that there are, I think from the count that I made, 18 greatest hits albums of Meatloaf, and I can't for a second believe that they are wildly different from each other. Uh, one of them is Meatloaf and Bonnie Tyler together. Oh, I don't. I don't even think I'm did. It. Was that Precious Metal? Was that right? Oh, was it that? Was, uh, do you know? What oh. I like to think I've got that. Uh, no, there's, there was a like a, a double. You know. Yeah, that, that years, was a Bonnie, years, basement years, album from the moment it was released. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. Mm. I mean, but when I was buying records. Back then, I mean, the people in the shop are trying to put them in the in your bag for nothing, as you were leaving. <laughs> it was so please, please take one. Take please them. take one. <laughs> <laughs> take, take this bunch of garage flowers as well. Please take this shit. <laughs> Here's an interesting fact. I didn't know this. I was just reading this now. Um, so I guess the, the third album, which is called Midnight at the Lost and Found which has a horrendous cover of like meatloaf and black and white with basically cut off here. And all you see is mm -hmm. the bottom half of his face yep. and his big body in the black sweater, right? I mean, for, for terrible title, terrible album cover. The, the record label was having a dispute with Jim Steinman and they didn't want to pay him the money to write the songs for this album. He actually had written for meatloaf for this album. You ready for this? Total Eclipse of the Heart and Making Love Out of Nothing for All. And because the record label would not let him work with Meatloaf for this album, he took those two songs to Bonnie Tyler and Air Supply. And I think we all know what happened to those two songs. Mega, mega songs. A what if scenario, what if they were able to make this work out and Meatloaf actually had both of those, uh, those songs on this album as it was originally planned, we'd be talking about probably another multi-million seller for Meatloaf. Yeah. Horrible album cover notwithstanding. Yeah. 
yeah, it's, it's hard to argue with that, to be fair. I mean, in a, a little bit more of a serious tone, there are many bumps along the way in the meatloaf story that he could have avoided. But yeah. I would suggest the main ones that derailed things at, at crucial points, to be fair, he probably couldn't. Losing your voice, you know, the things with Steinman, not having the songs at the right time. Steinman thinking, well, you know what, I'm just going to use these songs for myself. and Because he couldn't wait any longer, then Meat couldn't wait any longer. There's lots of things there that, that did derail it, I have to say. And it's interesting because in his defence, and that's not why I'm here, but in his defence, I actually think he's had a remarkably kind of pragmatic outlook on it all. When you ever look, the guy's a fascinating guy to listen to, and he's a great interview as well. Uh, and one of my favourite meatloaf moments, and I don't know if this goes beyond the UK, oh, what was the comedian's name? He's Keith Lemon now. What was his name, Simon? Adolf Merion or something like that? He used to always Sorry? wear a neck brace thing. <laughs> Well, yeah, I know his, his real name's Lee Francis, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, he was a, in a Neil media media media, media, wasn't he? Yeah, playing a role. And he yeah. went through a period where he would, and here's another UKism, just like Dennis Penis, okay? That name's no, no, no accident, okay? He would interview famous people on the red carpet and ask them the most inappropriate questions possible. That was the shtick, that was the whole point. And they didn't know it was coming. Some reacted okay and kind of thought, ah, ha, ah, ah, he's taking the piss here. Some didn't. Some really did not and shut it down immediately. And that was the game. That was the fun. And it was on some sort of chat show. And it was one of these things he would cut away to. And everyone would come back and they'd all be laughing. And Meatloaf was one of them. And he stopped them. And he asked them, can I interview you in song? So he starts to sing in this pathetic Meatloaf. It was meant to be pathetic. Meatloaf piss take. And man, oh man, does Meatloaf take him on. He sings every answer right back at him. And the first one he actually builds into, he actually goes, and builds into it, and he answers every question in full voice. And I can't remember who it was that was backstage, but he ended up singing about actually buying their underwear. Do you know, or who would, would you sell me their underwear that she's back? She's no, I would not tell you their underwear. And he ends that the actual the interview when he's asked whatever the inappropriate question is with fuck you. And the guy who's doing the interview has to actually give him a hug. I mean, he's done him. He's absolutely done him. <laughs> I gotta check that and out. It, it's, it's comedy gold. You should go and Google it. It's on, it's on YouTube. It's really, really funny. And that, for all the stick that I'm giving them, and I do think a lot of it really genuinely is merited. Much of this is a bit of fun. I, I really actually like the guy. I like him. I think that he's been quite honest and open about a lot of the issues and a lot of the problems. And he can now, probably because he's managed to claw some of that back, have a bit of a laugh about it. And he's certainly willing to laugh at himself, I think. Do you know, I think he's a bit of a hero, but I'm not a fan of his music particularly. <laughs> I'm saying all that. <laughs> I can't end that on a high because I'm not a fan of his music particularly. I'm really not. There's a two or three songs of his I like, but even going through the greatest hits that I bought more from my other half than me many moons ago, I still can't like it all because I just don't. It's overblown theatrical nonsense. Well, I tried my best. <laughs> Simon, any final words? Nope. Nope. Okay. <laughs> so, you, you guys, we didn't talk about it, but before we started taping, uh, both gentlemen actually asked me, like, what's the deal with meatloaf the food? And uh, here in the States, meatloaf is kind of like comfort food, right? It's, it's, it's actually a loaf of chopped meat and breadcrumbs and eggs and herbs and spices served with some kind of sauce and boom, there you have it. So, uh, but I would say probably if you were to talk to most folks here in the States, if they would prefer meatloaf versus fried chicken, I think fried chicken would win pretty much nine out of 10 times. Something about fried chicken that everybody loves, right? Even you guys, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all about the fried chicken tonight. I'm all about the fried chicken tonight. There's no two ways about that. There you go. I'm right. one of the strange people in the UK that have had meatloaf. Not like, stop it, stop it, right? <laughs> but I'm definitely all about the fried chicken tonight. There's no two ways about it. So, yeah, to, to put it out there, this is hopefully going to be an ongoing theme with myself and Simon. So I want to know do you like meatloaf or do you like fried chicken? Tell us in the comments. I want to know. And who else do you want to see dissected in this way? What else should we be butting heads against? What is the big debate? What matters to you? I, I want to know because 
You know, it don't can't say the doors. Be... Do not say the doors. That's no, not... I mean, it, the, the, it has to be within the realms of defensibility, and the doors don't fall into that category. <laughs> I, I quite, like, I quite so like, like the doors, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing me and Stephen actually agree on. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Hundred percent. Philip, I have to ask because I'm sure people are going to want to know: Are you guys on the same page about docking? Oh, oh, Ooh. well, I've listened to some docking. Like you know, I've listened to Truth and Now. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I listened to it last Friday on the way to work. And then last Sunday when I was walking the dog, um, I enjoyed it. But what, you, know, you, you never know whether you, whether you enjoy that kind of stuff in a um, ironic kind of style these days, because it's just so rooted in in the time that it was made. But do you know what I really, really enjoyed? Is it, did they have a, is it is the song Break the Chains? Yeah, Breaking the Chains, yeah. Oh, the Breaking video the for that's just, just utter, utter genius. Just, you know, just break the chains. <gasps> And I never, I never knew that Limal played guitar and bass for Dokken. I never knew that. <laughs> is Limal a thing in America? Is that, is that? No, never the ending story. Limal is the, the guy that's a never ending story. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you know, they've got, they've got the, the bird shit hairdo, yeah. haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I Dobbs and feel, Jeff definitely have the the Lamal on the go. They do, yeah, they do. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. they do. I yeah. don't feel the the urge to dash out and buy it, but I did stream it, and I probably. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes you just need that that eighties rock experience, don't you? Yeah. yeah. And I'll tell you what else I did. What else? I I listened to Tobruk for the first time in about thirty years, and uh, remembered how much how much I enjoyed it. So yeah. yeah. Uh, well, in that spirit, I was sent to go and listen to Blind Before I Stop, which kind of set this in motion. And I will be honest and admit that it's an okay bad mal- Magnum album. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, at least everybody went and did their homework, right? That's the important part. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's, uh, that wraps it up for this edition of UK Connection. Uh, we will be returning next week to uh, concert experiences. Stephen, what years are we doing next year? Oh, next year, yes. We can remember mean? things now. Come on. It's, we, did, we, did, we did, yeah, 87, 85 to 87 last time. So we'll be roughly a decade further down the line. So we'll be round about the end of the 90s is where we're going to go to. Yeah, we'll discuss this off air. Yes. 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 We will. Yes. So so don't ask me that. More. It will be. It will be late nineties, but we'll discuss exactly what you. <laughs> exactly right. The exact ones. Yes. So that'll now more coming. So stay tuned uh, next Saturday for more shenanigans with this trio. Uh, this is us on the web with www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Well, Enjoy the rest of the Saturday. Let's tune in tomorrow for our album homework assignment. We've got. Sean Tonar going up against Eric Porter tomorrow. And then uh, Monday starts the nonsense all over again with the Hudson Valley Squares. So uh, thanks for watching. For Stephen Reed and Simon Bray, I am Pete Pardo. Have a good one, everybody. See you real soon.